hello and welcome to the show. I'm Nadia Giordana and you are watching It's a Woman's World. Our guest today is Robin Jameson. She's the author of The Magic of Modern Art. And she's going to give us some tips about appreciating modern art, which as sometimes we we know for our own experiences can be complicated and difficult to understand and appreciate. So let's go meet Robin and learn more. But first I'll introduce you to our co-hosts. Welcome to the show and welcome Barbara Lavalure as co-host today to the show. It's always so great when I can have you on the show. Thank you, Nadia. And Anne McKenna, I haven't seen you for a while. I'm delighted that you're here with us today. I am so delighted too. It's always good to be here and I definitely look forward to meeting the guest and hearing more about the book. This is going to be an interesting conversation. And our guest, Robin Jamison. Welcome, Robin. It's so great to have you here today. I'm just thrilled. Thank you so much. And I'm thrilled as well. Let's, uh, uh, Barbara, why don't you start off? Uh, well, I'd love to. Since I've known Robin for a few years, we actually met through a transformational educational company that's called Landmark Worldwide. Uh, doing programs on Zoom. So it's fitting that we're in the Zoom platform. And, and uh, so um, I, I've admired Robin from a distance because we've never met personally. Um, and when I found out that she had written the, the Magic of Modern Art, I thought, wow, I need to read this because quite frankly, um, if I were to be honest, I would say, I've never really felt like I understood modern art until I read Robin's book. So um, why don't you start us out, Robin, and talk about a little bit about your background perhaps, and then when, you, when did you start thinking about writing the magic of modern art and how long did it take you to do it and those kinds of things. Okay, well, um... The idea for it started a really long time ago. After I finished undergraduate art school, I had a job at a modern museum, modern and contemporary museum that had really, really great shows. And I started out as a security guard. So I was standing in the galleries all the time and I would overhear what the visitors would say. And some of them loved it. And some of them more than I was thrilled about really hated it or were baffled by it or confused or upset. And, and I would listen to their comments and I would think, oh my gosh, they're missing so much. If they could just see it how I see it, they would have a blast. So um, I, I, took a, I started listening really carefully to their comments to hear what their comments revealed. And what I discovered was that there were certain things that were preventing them from being able to appreciate the art. And they were obviously ideas that they had that they walked in with. Like, um, like they would say, I'm sure you've heard this before, my five-year-old could do that. And I, what I heard in that was, oh, they think it should look difficult. Mm -hmm. And then they would say, well, that doesn't look like anything. And I would say, oh, that means that they think it should look like something recognizable. And I started to be able to tell what the things were that they thought that were in the way. And then I also noticed that those thoughts and their, and their desire to understand it at an intellectual level were probably what was getting in the way the most. So I started doing art tours and I took about 10 people at a time and I would take them to some very progressive contemporary art show. And then I would run, this through, run them through this process that I thought would work and it did. And the people who went said that they came away being able to appreciate it and more relaxed about it and more confident about it. So I realized I was onto something. And I mean, I, what I didn't say is that when I heard the people in the museum, I thought I need to change this. 
I can do something about this. It's not necessary. It's not hard. It doesn't have to be hard to appreciate modern and contemporary art. So anyway, so that I did the tours and then I thought, well, I need to get a wider audience. So I wrote the book, but it took me a, many starts and stops before I actually completed it. And it was published in um, April. Also, I'm an art, I'm a fine artist myself. Anyway, just wanted to add that. Yeah, thanks. Anne, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Um, so what's the vision for your book moving forward? Oh, I love that question. Thank you. So my vision that I've, t and, and it's really my commitment for the whole thing is that I'm creating a movement. And what the ultimate vision is, is a world where everyone everywhere experiences the magic and wonder of modern and contemporary art. So the book is really in service of that vision. It's not just about a book. Uh, I have a interesting question, at least uh, 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 it occurs to me from time to time when I'm in a museum. I love art in general. Uh, the old masters make my heart go pitter pat. Uh, modern art, I find certain pieces fascinating and interesting and some I love and some I don't. Some I hate, some I say a five-year-old could have done it, some I say I could do better than that. Others I just completely don't understand and I know I'm not alone in that. What are a couple of the I think most important things for us to take away to be able to look at this art in such a way as to come away with something valuable. It doesn't have to be like, am I right? You don't have to like it in order to come away with some sort of value from it. Right. Well, you kind of already said a lot of a piece of what I was would would say to what you brought up, and that is that liking and appreciating are really distinct. There's an overlap. You're going to be able to appreciate the work that you like, but you can also have a really deep appreciation for the work that you don't like or even work that you hate. In fact, when I do the tours, or when I did the tours with people, I may do some more. Um, I would have them find a piece that they particularly disliked and have them spend about a half hour with it and just um, notice, notice their thoughts, notice, pay attention to what they were seeing, move around and look at it from different angles. Notice if they were having body sensations, notice if, if the piece started to remind them of something. And in every case, what happened was that the piece seemed to change to them over time. And they came away with an experience of having been deeply touched, whether, whether or not they ever said, well, yeah, I don't, it's fine if you don't want it in your living room. You know, it's fine if you don't want to see it every day. And it's fine if you don't understand it. One of the things that really gets in the way is thinking that every work of art has a specific meaning. And, part of, and our job is to figure out what it is. So one of the things I like to tell people is that whatever it means to them is great. And if it doesn't mean anything, that's great. And once, it's, once a work of art is out of the artist's hands, it's not up to them anymore. It's up to the viewer. It's, it's between you and the art. And the artist has nothing to say about it anymore. Their job is done. I, I was at a... Um, at a gallery and, and this little girl pointed at, at a painting and she goes, oh, mommy, that looks like a taco. And it was, a, it, was an, it was an abstract work of art. It wasn't, didn't have any content. And the artist happened to be standing right there and the mother turned to the artist and she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And the artist said, if, you're, if she sees a taco, it's a taco. <laughs> so I would say that to everyone, if it's a taco to you, it's a taco. I love that, Robin. I, you know, I think that's one of the things that I, well, I know one of the things I got about your book. I am, full confession, one of those people that probably spends a minute 
or less, walking through a gallery, especially modern art gallery, and it, 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 they, if the piece doesn't grab me, uh, literally, it's 30 seconds or less. Yeah. And uh, when I read about your um, practice of, you know, either standing there or in my case, because I don't stand for a half an hour at a time in one spot, a uh, sitting and looking at a painting for 15 minutes at least, if not a half an hour, then I, I know that I would see and get and appreciate that piece, even if I didn't like it. Yeah. And I don't have to like a piece of art to appreciate it for yeah. sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I loved about your book, and I have, I, have, I have it right here, The Magic of Modern Art. I love the presentation, the way you have laid out the book. Mm. And, uh, and you also have many pieces of art in there. Um, so it was very enjoyable and easy to read. Did okay. you do all that or did you have help with? Um, um, I had help. I had my hands in all of it, but I, def I had a designer. Yeah. A fabulous, wonderful, amazing designer worked with me on it. Great. And I also had help in the organization of the book and the, and the editing of it as mm -hmm. it went. Very good. Um, well, yeah, the, I, design, the, the designer did, um, yeah, he did a stellar job and we were very compatible. I can see this book at, um, uh, as, as a, uh, an instruction manual, if you will, in modern art galleries. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, actually the, there's a museum, the first, you know, it hasn't, the book hasn't been out very long, but there is one museum that has begun using it for docent training, which just thrills me to the core. It's, wow. um, yeah, I'm, and it was, and the best part, I think, or one of the good parts about it was that it was the director's idea. He fell, he, he fell in love with the book and he said, he said the best thing to me. He said, why reinvent the wheel when you've got it all in here? So I was, wow. that was a huge acknowledgement. Perfect. The, uh, I wanted to say that about the art, the art that's in the book, all of the art that I that's represented in the book was done by the artists that I interviewed for, as part of the book. So I interviewed 17 different art professionals because I wanted to see what their take is. Well, how did they look at it? Not was I didn't interview with them about their own work or their process. I asked them what did they, what did they do when they go to museums and galleries? And then I took excerpts from those. And um, that's a chapter in the book. And then the ones of them who are actually artists themselves all have their work in the book. And I intentionally wanted to use work from artists that people might not be familiar with. So they didn't feel like, oh, I'm supposed to like that because it's famous. <laughs> so they could have a fresh experience. So that's great. Um, I'm wondering, um, when you write a book, you have like an audience in mind. And I haven't personally read the book. I hope to. Uh, my kids love, love, love art. Ooh. And they are okay. always drawing. And, mm. you know, um, I think I've learned a lot about art just by observing them, especially with even how they express their own emotions Mm -hmm. is that it's so easy to read what they are feeling mm -hmm. by looking at what they are drawing. Ooh. Um, mm -hmm. So what's your audience for the book? Who do you intend to see reading this book? Oh, that's, I love your, your question. It's, um, I love, you're at, you all are asking the best questions. Thank you so much. Um, my point of view is that our education system robs people of the opportunity to delve into art as we grow up in, any, in, a, in a deep way, unless, unless we are the people who are artists and we kind of funnel over in that direction. So most people don't have exposure to much art through their schools past maybe sixth grade. So the idea is that that people develop at that young age are the ones they carry into adulthood. So no wonder, no wonder they think, you know, who is the class artist? 
the class artist was, was the kid who could draw realistically the best, right? So we grow up thinking that's how you judge art. So um, my audience, who I wrote the book for is really people like, um, like Nadia and Barbara who, and I don't know, maybe you to some extent, who um, don't feel confident and are might maybe frustrated by modern art and, and even the people who have given up on it altogether. That was one of the things about the people who were at the museum and their comments. The thought I had was, gosh, these are the people who are still coming to the museum. Imagine what it's like for the people who gave up altogether. So that's who the book was really targeting. Yet a lot of the people that have the book in their hands now and have read it are people who were already modern art fans and they tell me that even so, that it broadens and deepens their ability to appreciate it. Yes. I get it finally what the benches are for in the museums. <laughs> I've always just walked through and you're spinning past much of this art. But if you sit down on those lovely benches that I thought were just for the old people that come through the gallery. It's really for taking the time to appreciate the art. I never knew that before. I'm, I, I'm revealing something about myself. Delightful I, that you see that. I love it. <laughs> I, I made a couple of notes when I was reading it. Um, and one of them is from page 113, and I, I don't expect you to have your book there, but um, you were writing about fine art has no function except to be experienced by the audience. But I, I have to say, I don't know that I agree with you on that. For example, I was thinking, well, what about the fine artists that paint to sell? Ah, got it. Oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> So you're saying that's the function of it? Well, it, it <laughs> is a function of it. It's, it, it right. I just I just thought, hmm, I don't know. What about those people, <laughs> those artists? If you decide to have another profession, Barbara, you might want to go into law. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Finding the loophole. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, artists, you know, artists who are who earn their living with their art are the people, you know, definitely are, are doing it and the hopes that it will sell. It's a very slippery slope for artists. It's a different conversation, but it's a, it's a slippery slope when you paint to sell because then you're um, adjusting what you're creating to fit your audience. And a lot of times the free expression is um, then lost. And I, that's not what I meant by function. I meant like, if you can drink out of it, it's, it may be a phenomenal mug, but I would call that uh, fine craft rather than fine art. By yeah. function, I meant that it's not something you can use. Yeah, okay, all right, <laughs> okay. All right, well, I'm gonna give you one more before I turn it over to Anne. <laughs> Nobody has ever said that before, I love it, okay. Um, so. <laughs> You, when you talk about line, this is on page 122, when you talk about line as marks made by, a, by moving a, mark, uh, a marking tool like a pencil or a pen or a paintbrush between two points, um, what would you say about the artists who paint outside lines? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, I don't know, I don't quite get what you mean. Do you mean like that they're, so the, <laughs> The point can be outside the lines, it's okay. But it's just a, it's just a way of, of explaining what a line is, but it's yeah. not like there's two points and then you connect them, like and connect the dots. It's yeah. more that if you, in physics or geometry rather, if you have two points, you could say that the end of the line is those two points. And it could be anywhere. Well, I, I, I wasn't trying to be on this pace. <laughs> I was just having a bit of fun with you. <laughs> I think I better turn it over to Anne. <laughs> yeah, so um, Adia on Robin, you said, um, so how we interpret a picture is 
is how it is. So if I look at a picture, I look at an art on the wall, whatever it speaks to me is what it is. Now, what's the connection between what I'm interpreting and what the artist is trying to communicate? Because I'm wondering when you do an image, when you do a picture, are you trying to communicate something as an artist? So what's the connection between what the artist is trying to communicate and what the viewers are understanding? Um, I'd, let me take a second to kind of gather my thought about that. The way artists communicate is different from the way a writer communicates. I would say that art is more is more close to poetry so that it's really open to interpretation rather than prose type literature. So when an artist is is creating their piece and communicating it's more like they're getting it out they're getting it out of them and into a physical form more than they're saying when this person looks at it they should see this mm -hmm. so it's it's so they're getting their feelings and thoughts and whatever put into a visual form which is a way that they can't, there's no other way to do it. You can't, it's not, it's not something you can put into words. And then they've done their expression. And then once that's done, then the people who look at it will see what they see. And in some cases, it'll be exactly how it was for the artist. And, and the artist would say, yeah, that's exactly what was going on with me. And in other cases, it might be completely different and that's fine. You know, one of the things I'm really committed to is that people feel free and confident when they when they are spending time with the art. So they're not second guessing themselves and not questioning whether they're seeing it correctly. Okay. Our time is getting short. We're down to about three minutes, but uh, I wanted to ask you, Robin, is there anything that we haven't asked you that you for sure want to uh, make the audience know about? Uh, let me think for just a second. Um, oh yeah, one thing is I do wanna to refer to what Barbara was asking. We, rather, this is not a, a question to ask, but you, Barbara was asking questions from the section of the book that's called Art Savvy, Developing Art Savvy. And that's the only part of the book that's I, I would call informational in the traditional sense. And it's designed for people to uh, know the difference between certain things and have and have access to the language, the terminology that's used a lot in art. But most of the book is really devoted to just opening it up, opening it up experientially. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, I do want to say one thing is that the entire title of the book is The Magic of Modern Art. How would a love modern and contemporary well, art. Well, there are a few points I'd like to go over and make sure that I've really said everything that, that, I, that I think is important about the work that I'm doing and about my book. So just to be really clear, I think this, this has been said, but the point of the book is really to make modern and contemporary art accessible to everyone. And I really stand on the notion that everyone has a natural affinity for all kinds of art, and there's no reason for modern and contemporary art to be left out. And so one of the things I've noticed is that um, lots of ways that people are taught that they should understand modern art and contemporary art or art in general is through learning art history or learning about the artist and, and all of that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, I think. And um, so my book and my approach is non-academic because I wanna get to the heart of it. The heart of it is being able to really have a deep personal experience with the art that makes you want to have that experience, that makes you want to go to museums and exhibits and that it's a turn on, you know, and, and um, 
So that's one of that's one of the really important things. So the book is really non-academic and it's written in a conversational tone. Another thing that makes it different is that it's not directed directed toward any particular works of art. It's about being able to explore modern and contemporary art in general, all of it, any of it with freedom and confidence. Um, so I say that when people have difficulty with modern and contemporary art, it's because there's something in the way, not because they lack an, an information, not because they don't know enough. And so the kinds of things that are in the way are ideas either about the art or about oneself or about the art world. Like, you know, if you walk into a museum and you think that modern art is a sham, guess what? It's gonna seem like a sham to you and, and you're gonna be frustrated and not have a good time and even feel intimidated by the art sometimes. So um, I'm really clear that, that through dispelling those counterproductive ideas that something really opens up. And then once there's that openness because of removing the obstacles, then you can actually begin to learn um, how to be with the art, how to experience it, some ideas about what to think about. And I have a, a couple of tours in the book, three actually. And then I also have um, in my book, there's a QR code that takes you to a digital flip book that walks you through the main points. And, and so you could use the flip book while you're in a museum or while you're in a gallery to remind you about what to think about. And, um, so that you can have the very best experience possible when with the art. Um, and then I just wanna add, and um, I think I actually said this about um, before about what Barbara had asked, that there is a section of, book, of the book that's designed to give people some basics. So you can talk about it. You can talk about art using certain terminology that everyone understands about art. So I, that's really just added so that people have more confidence and feel free. Well, that's our time is up for today. I want to thank you for being on the show. Robin, we could have talked for another hour. Mm -hmm. Barbara and Anne, thank you. And thank you everyone for watching today. This is It's a Woman's World. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Thanks everyone, this was fun.